Is he not joining us? To ask the sheep. No, he has something. I don't remember what. Um, but that's okay. <sighs> I'm going to text Sally because she might have forgotten. <laughs> 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 She's had an exciting week. Oh, she became a grandmother again. Exactly, yes. Oh, so brilliant. Yeah, and a little girl. Yeah, all healthy and, you know, that looked lovely. Oh, no, there's Sally's phone. There we go. Oh. <laughs> You'll tell me all. <laughs> Yay. Hello. Is everyone okay? Healthy and happy, or at least healthy? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Good. Good. I'm ensuring my lungs work well. Yeah. yeah. Going up hills. Where are you today, Mark? <coughs> uh, I'm going up towards Glatton Beacon. I'm on Stain Street. Uh-huh. And uh, if you could zoom in that direction, you can see Chichester Spire in a direct straight line down Stain Street. So, uh, proving the Romans right with their um, straight roads, you know. Yeah. Are you just going for a walk? Yes. <laughs> I, I figure it's better than sitting around because a lot of evenings now, there's Zoom things and... Uh, you know, I do tabletop simulator and meeting with friends online and things. And all my evenings have become sit in front of a computer evening. And since yeah. that's what I do all, all day as well, I'm trying to get out as much as I can after work. That's such a good idea. Mm. Yes. Do you find do you find you're out actually more than you used to be? Uh, not anymore. I was when I was furloughed. Ooh, nice thistle. Yeah. Uh, I was when I was furloughed, but... Um, no, now it's sort of back to normal, really. Mm. Maybe more, actually, because there's more evenings off. Mm. I definitely am out more than I used to be. Um, just because, you know, I like being outside and it's a good opportunity to do it. <laughs> yes. yes, it is, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Ooh. It's and I must with the longer evenings, isn't it? With oh, the long evenings long are lovely, evening. except when we have clouds like today, but yeah. I was down your neck of the woods, actually, um, Laura, today. <gasps> I should have Bottom. replied because you had a sourdough starter I could have had. Oh, yeah, you should have replied. Bad luck. <laughs> so, <laughs> next time. I've still got them. I've still got them. Oh, yes, so. please. Yes, please. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, no, it's really nice. I went down because somebody was offering a stair gate on free cycle. Ooh. <laughs> And around Bosom Way, so I thought we'll go for a walk around there. And we actually went down to a bit I've never been to before, which I'm sure you all know really well, Bosom Ho, oh, down yeah. where the Itch oh, and yeah. a Ferry comes down, you know, the big yeah, Itch and yes. a Ferry? Yeah, it's so we went down. Fishing off. Spot the what? Oh, it's a good spot for fishing off, all those ferry points. Oh. Yes, probably, but the tide was right out, and we just walked along there and then back along the road, and then sat and had <laughs> coffee in a thermos. That's a new one since the, um, <laughs> <laughs> since um, I, all this business. <laughs> I, had, I had coffee from um, a cafe in Hotham Park. They're doing takeaway service now. Mm. And the friends and I, who were sat socially distanced, having our coffee, said that's the first coffee that we haven't made ourselves since, Goodness knows it must be March sometime. It's extraordinary. Yeah. Oh, hello, Alex. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yes, it's lovely, isn't it? I'll tell you where else they've got them. And that's at Westdean Stores. You can get one. Um, oh, and yeah. which is a lovely walking from there. You can walk up oh. onto the trundle. And uh, oh yeah, Itchener in the by the yacht club there at the back. Right. Very, very nice coffee there. And then mm. drink it on the um, on the front there. Lovely. Oh, beautiful. And Emsworth <laughs> have them in Driftwood, that nice cafe in Emsworth. Mm. And it's partner at Stansted. They, they're open as well from 10 o'clock in the morning. You can't sit down anywhere. All the tables are there. I can't stop. And they have three stations. All the tables have been moved out. And they have three stations by pillars. And you go and order. You go and stand by your allocated pillar. So the girl comes up. But nobody was wearing masks and nobody was wearing gloves, which I thought was interesting. And that was raised this evening on the Prime Minister's questions. Those people who are giving out coffees, why are they not wearing masks and gloves? 
The problem with gloves is if people don't use them properly, they're actually more dangerous. Mm. Was there a thing right. in France that was saying basically what you should do is pretend you've got dog mess on your fingers and you'll never touch anything you shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> that's it you nice. have to pretend you've got dog mess on your fingers and everyone's a smoker and you want to stay away from them <laughs> <laughs> lovely so wearing gloves if you're touching your face and then there's no protection at all yeah i can i can understand that um, yeah so the it makes sense. Hotton park cafe serving at Hotton park cafe um she said they won't let you use your own reusable mugs anymore because you used to be able to take you reusable because they don't want to take that from you. Um, mm. I paid cash because it didn't occur to me that this funny little square device sitting by the thing was actually a swipe thing. <laughs> so I could have paid by card and they prefer you to pay. Um, mm. so that is cash. And she that immediately is... sanitized her hands. Yeah. So I have a question. That... I have a question. I'm interrupting. The um, how how do you all feel about improvising? <laughs> I wish oh. I could. <laughs> Back on my life. I wish I could. <laughs> okay. Okay. Hold, hold that thought. So, how do you feel about the first however many minutes we've been on this call, the, the conversation? Uh -huh. I see what you're doing. Has that been yes. scary? <laughs> Did you feel you couldn't speak? <laughs> no, you're not really. very well. There is a slight but, difference, Laura. A slight difference. Only a slight difference, actually. You used far more words than we would in music. In music, there are very few notes that you might have used. But that but makes think, it harder, in a way. Well, it could make it harder, but I think we're far more intimidated by things beside the task itself. You know. Well, can I can I interrupt there and yeah. just say that when I did when I did your cello weekend and we had that improvisation class, I was absolutely there's no way I'm doing that. There's no way I can do that. Absolutely not. But when I realised um, that actually, I still didn't do it very well or anything. But I realised it's all done on a scale. So if you just know the notes of your scale, the arpeggios of the key you're playing in, you just play a few of those and odd notes. It's not anywhere near as hard. So I would say to all of you, have have a go. <laughs> I mean, long the, the workshop I did a long time ago, it was Trevor Y, who's big name flute, and he said, um, he played a phrase, he told us what key he's going to play in, he played a phrase, and we were supposed to copy it. I didn't know what note he'd started on. Mm -hmm. Ah, can't do it. Um, then you went round the round the group, and we were all supposed to improvise a phrase, and everybody copy it. I couldn't do it if I don't know what note it's going to start on. Okay, I know the scale, I know the key. But let's okay. So let's take an example because the talking thing we're all good at. And if you're a uh, an ordinary person, not doing a a fancy talk or an academic -y talk or something. Even if it's a basic sort of day, you know, some small child, you might use two to three hundred words per day, different words, small sort of, you know, happy vocabulary of common words. And that's a lot of words compared to our notes. But if I said to everybody, could you tell me something about your lunch? Probably everybody could say something. It might be very different things they said. But you know, you know, like Colette saying she didn't know, you don't know what note they're starting on. It's like saying you don't know what the topic is, you know, or they might say something about it, but it would be no good if somebody said culinary topics and it sounded really strange and you weren't sure like, you know, is this a like a chef technique thing or, but if somebody says actually your lunch and you know that everybody had, we hope everybody had the opportunity to have lunch today, then somebody could say oh grabbed a crust of bread or you know i made this amazing something and you know mark would have foraged in the woods and found <laughs> tiny you know <laughs> i don't know <laughs> but whatever it is it, it could be very different but i think so musically can we think of how what are the things that we would want to feel comfortable and what would be the equivalent of our obviously not two to three hundred words but let's think of like two to three 
parameters instead of words? What are the kind of things we could set as basic components or limits that would make us feel safe in music? Tempo. I, I would take, oh, sorry. Um, Alex said tempo. Yeah, go on, Anne. Yeah, I, I would take a bit of what Colette was saying and a bit of what Sally was saying. And, and from there, it, it might give a little bit of a chance to get going. And, and I would, I, I would, I would go with Colette on her note or the first note of the scale. But then, as Sally says, the the triads, the the arpeggios from each note in that scale. Mm. So almost like if you're a beginner, and let's say we're all beginners. So my son in his Spanish class, he's got, uh, you know, or even science class, some of his homework at the moment, they have a sentence with a missing word. And at the bottom, they've got all the words you can choose from, you know, and it was like, uh, actually it was in his food tech. It was like leftover blank can be turned into a blank. And it was like pasta can be turned into a casserole. And you, you know, you might not have thought of the answer, but the words were right there. So if you knew, it starts on a G, and you can use the choices of these three choices. Which ones do you want to choose? You know, then maybe we'd all feel that actually it's not, you're not quite so left in the dark to decide everything for yourself. Mm. I think but, and having, oh, yeah, go on, Mark. go on. All right. Well, the, so the trouble the, in a way with that is that the less w words in inverted commas you're allowed to use, the more words seem wrong. And the more you've got a sort of massive ratio where there's a million notes you could play and only several that are going to sound right. And uh, I'm speaking for myself, that's a sort of trouble. With trombone, you can kind of get away with it a little bit by just moving, but it's still, it seems like there's, there's infinitely more notes that are acceptable than are unacceptable. It can, I, mean. I think it can depend on what we're what expectations we put on ourselves. If we think we're supposed to create something that is like a classical symphony, that's uh -huh. you know a very different expectation than um, than we're supposed to do a one note samba. You know, is it about the rhythm thing that we're doing, or is it about the the fact that two different people are answering with something very similar but ever so slightly different? Or is it magically supposed to be um, some preformed wonderful idea that you know we think oh good composers do that? So I think. I see. Do you see what I mean? Because I think people I, I, yeah. people do that when they when they swap from like classical to jazz or classical to pop music, and it's not often you know. But sometimes in pop music we go well that's so simple, but it's more about the buildup of a texture rather than the complicated note lines. You know, yes, so I see. It, is a different, I guess it'd be looking at different sorts of art. But I don't think yeah. people know what's expected or what they're supposed, people don't explain anything. They just say, do that, improvise. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I had some singing lessons um, some years ago, just a few. And the teacher there, she, she sang me a phrase and said, now give me a response. And I'm thinking, oh, my dear, you know, I, I am so self-conscious with this. And I gave her something, but it was probably so basic. It was unbelievable and so dull and probably not even in the right key or the tone or whatever. But, but what does basic and dull mean in this context? Mm. For me, anything that doesn't sound right. <laughs> <laughs> but it is so difficult and I think we don't have one thing is we don't have the opportunity and the practice um, I mean if you're if you're doing if you're learning a language from the beginning there are all those you have those basic recordings where somebody says like bonjour you know and then you say like bonjour and it doesn't really matter if it's not quite right but it's that kind of encouragement to do the thing and practice it Whereas once, once what happens usually is we get to quite a high level and, you know, we're all competent classical musicians. And then, and then the difference between where we are now and trying something new is so huge. It feels like well, something you don't want what to What exactly is improvisation? Because it seems to be covering lots of things. Do you have to respond to somebody else? It can um, be. Because I had the most extraordinary experience this afternoon. I thought I'll play the bass. And somebody had been talking on WhatsApp about just having a little 
fiddling around with notes before they set off on a piece. And I tried it and I had a wonderful time. And I think it's this terribly strict, awful upbringing of scales and pieces and follow the music and never look away. Yes. I just looked out the window and relaxed and I was by myself. And it didn't matter whether it was going to be discordant or what. And every now and then I, I did something rather nice and rather wished I recorded it. But is that composition, mm -hmm. not improvisation? No, that's improvising. What? That's it. But uh, improvising can be is composition as well. It, it was extraordinary. I mean, honestly, it was eye-opening. I, I would never have done it if that person hadn't written on what. Particularly in this country, maybe in our older <laughs> era, our childhood, the way we were taught music originally, we weren't taught to play by ear. No, so I never listened to my yeah. If you happen to live in a very, very musical family that was into jazz or folky stuff, then you probably did play by ear. But people like me, you sit at the piano and you've got to do it right and you get a tap on the wrist if you get a note wrong and you're scared of doing an exam because you're bound to get a note wrong. Um, it kills any chance of you wanting to improvise because you're so, you become so dependent on the dots in front of you. I think, I think that that's like I said, what did I say um, in my message? I said that we condition, mm. and, and Colette, I think I agree with you. We, we had to do what was in front of you, and my mm. goodness me, you were not encouraged to move away from it, not allowed to move away from it, otherwise, mm. you know, slap wrist. You know, no, I, I agree, and, mm. I, and I think we got conditioned, and I, I quite like that word. Mm. Um, Part of the Benedetti sessions, um, one of the guys, um, he was taking the piece of Paganini and, and talking again about the scale of it, the scale that it was in and everything. And he was improvising from that and he was jazzing it up using the, the triads from the scales, um, from the notes. And, and it was just amazing, you know, and, and it was just that freedom to feel yeah. it, to do it. And, and again, going back to Sally's, knowing the, the arpeggios or the triads from the scale. Yeah. I feel yeah. This, uh, this links up with the um, problem I have is that I absolutely can't remember. I can't do any music without reading the music off the page. I can't, it won't go in my head. And I sort of feel there's a link that if you improvise, you've got to kind of, you've got to free yourself from what you're reading. It's a combination of framework and freedom, isn't it? I suppose you have to have the framework to let other people join in, but uh, it's then getting that freedom within the framework. So I, I mean, speaking for myself, I get so hung up on the rules whenever I try to do it, that I'm never able to actually, you know, like I, if I realize what chord it's in, I try, then I'm just sort of doing, literally playing an arpeggio. And it's no more creative than a written piece of music would be, if you see what I mean. However, <laughs> we're witnessing you taking a walk on a footpath where you feel free, even though there's a guided structure. <laughs> I, uh, well I'm said. <laughs> it's, uh, and if there's yes, somebody else on the path, you're able to navigate and meet them, greet them, and keep an appropriate distance so that you don't get in their way. That. I guess this is mostly familiarity and instincts, isn't it? Is that, is that the, uh, I, something? Yes, yes, and it's about understanding different things and then and being bold and free to do it. But I think, I think you're, the conditioning is true, yes. And also, I mean, you can take another um, analogy. We don't, in writing, you're taught creative writing. You are encouraged and nurtured at how to do these things. In music, Partly because it's not taught in the same, it's not a subject that has multiple streams. You don't have creative writing and, um, you know, English literature and poetry and all this for music. You have music. And if you're lucky, you get one very inspiring teacher every once in a while. Otherwise, whatever you get is what you get, you know. Yeah, I think coming, from a, coming, coming from a technical background of years and years of piano, I never gave it a thought, this improvisation. Then I changed across to organ. And my tutor said to me, oh, he said, you've got to extemporize and you've got to improvise. And I, I said, what? <clears throat> he said, well, go on and play me something. I said, I can't. I haven't got any notes. I didn't know what he was on about. And he found it 
very difficult to teach. He gave me some ideas and I tried it and it sounds like jolly awful. I thought, well, that's the end of that. <laughs> so I gave up because it sounded dreadful. If it doesn't sound musical, I can't, can't be dealing. It's not harmonic, I can't be dealing. I, there's no rules. He couldn't teach me anything. And I, I found that very strange because of all of our backgrounds, for the sounds of it, were all the same. We were taught how to do the piano and you did it right. And you hoped you yeah. didn't get it wrong because you were in deep doodle otherwise. But, but in, in a way, I think the trouble was the complete flip side working. of that. But yeah. I think the thing we how were to follow never... the notes, not how to play the, play, the instrument, as it were. Yeah. I but think well, there's, a, there's an analogy. There's an analogy with learning how to. I mean, most of us, I think, grew up before computers became the thing that we used most of during the day, and and not having a not having an instruction book to tell you how to do whatever it is has been a, a, a challenge for me. But now I'm getting used to thinking well there's got to be an answer i'm going to go and find it and i sort of feel that maybe improvisation is along those lines except i can't translate it into music well there's a lot of listening and seeking and the difference so this was um i think colette saying with the note when you learned the music you've got the notes in front of you and then or Anne as well you know you get the slap on the wrist if it's not right there's a big difference learning music from listening first yeah. and learning That's music from the dots today. first and in yeah. some styles they don't learn from the dots at all but in others, I mean, if you ever try to do a classical piece and you think, at, like one of the Von Williams uh, oboe concerto that most of us hadn't heard of, if we listen to that a lot and then approach the dots, it would be very different than if we got the sheet music in the post and just looked at the dots and then listened to it and went, oh, that's how my part fits in. It's a different, mm -hmm. it's a whole different perspective. I, I, worked, I worked a lot with children, with young children. And... Um, you give, you just put the musical instruments out and just let them play. And they just pick anything up and do anything with it. So they might hit a guitar, not strum, or they might go across the top of a drum, not hit. And so I learned a lot from watching them that just touch it and just do anything with it to just as if you've never seen it before. And I think a lot of you, because you've played your own instruments for a long time you have you've forgotten how um when it was new and oh what is this oh is that i wonder what that does whereas with me because i'm new to to percussion <laughs> i just i just gotta go and, oh what does that sound like oh oh what is that? <laughs> i'm just gonna try it yeah and so, so i'm seeing it from a child's view of just having a go I always miss a tribute to it. I always think it's Thelonious Monk, but I think it wasn't actually him. But anyway, who, who said that the whole, the basis of being a, um, a, a jazz player was being able to love whatever you produce. Yeah. And, and with that attitude, then, you know, it, it'll be all right. And you can just keep going and eventually something will, uh, something will come out, which I guess goes back to... Um, uh, you know, playing the bass by the window in a relaxed place. Yeah. Um, yeah. I suppose Dorothy's saying it's a change of mindset, isn't it? It's got to come yeah. from your head. It's got to, got to actually change the way we think about it, yeah. which is very difficult, as Sylvia's saying. You know, I too have been, you know, very classical background, just brought up with, you know, Mrs. Jack's probably wrapping me on the knuckles and I played the wrong notes. <laughs> you know, so mm -hmm. just the, the way we've been taught, it's very, very difficult. But worth a try. I mean, I think there's, it's worth it. There's an exercise that um, is uh, that you can do, which is modified from one of my students, because one of my students who's a grown-up um, uh, likes to play practice with the television on. I would not recommend that, because that sounds crazy. You know, she, she puts on cooking shows late at night to calm her and make her a little distracted and plays like a souffle. But instead of that, <laughs> my suggestion is to put on the radio and listen to a radio, um, you know, whether it's the archers or a play, and you accompany the play. So you listen to the story of the words and you make some sounds. And it might be just a long sound. It might be some percussive sounds. It might be a melodic line, a little burst of something. But see if you can do something that is a response to what you're hearing. Um, That's incredible. Really, they used to do that in the theatres. 
And my my father-in-law, I never actually heard him play, but apparently when he was younger, he used to accompany films in the cinema. And I believe, um, you know, he was literally just responding. It must be total improvising mm -hmm. all the time. And he lost the job when he got distracted and played the wrong stuff. So the tone wrong for the film. <laughs> <laughs> I, when I when I used to read books to the children, so if you imagine the Billy Goat's Gruff, and I used to sit at the piano and just up came the up came the dragon, boom, and I just bang on the piano and made sounds. And I didn't know what I wasn't playing notes. I was just banging on the piano and then trip trap trip trap trip trap um, to go along with the book with the story I was telling the children, and that's how it, that's how I got it on the piano. Yeah. One of the things my lovely Elaine, who you knew as a violinist, who teaches me piano, um, she showed me when I was quite early on in learning, she showed me that you can play anything on the black on the black keys and it will always sound fine. And it's just lovely. You can just sit and tinkle away on all the black notes and it will always be lovely. <laughs> It's and a I pentatonic, isn't it? Theoretically, <laughs> why that is. Why yeah, it's, Mark just said it's a pentatonic scale, so it means you've got all the notes in one scale, okay. and, and you're not deviating. So any of any order makes it work. Right, well, it's wonderful. And there's no <laughs> there's no semitones, so you right. don't have the the tension built with like, oh, I'm leading here, but I've gone wrong. Oh yeah, yeah, of course. But it's great if you're playing with children, if you've got grandchildren, you know, you play the black notes up that end, I'll play the black notes down there. And you play it together. It's lovely. The only oh, ones that they can make feel comfortable with. Oh. Something I was thinking about with the, because, uh, well, I mean, this was I was mentioning about performance, because, seems to me that the classical music is very um, oriented towards performance. Uh, almost the only purpose of classical music is for performance. I mean, maybe that's not quite right, but it's, um, it seems that way a little bit. And I sort of, I think there's a connection here between uh, this sort of idea of improvisation where it's, um, because it's a framework everyone can join in and you don't need to have an audience where everyone can be a performer and I, don't, I yeah sorry this is what I was thinking about when I said the, the message but I, I didn't know um, I my thoughts get a little bit hard to um, exactly put into simple words at that point I don't want to take up the time just rambling on um, but I wondered if anyone had any thoughts on that sort of area well there's the definitely idea. There's definitely a sense of us and them in many classical concerts. Um, and there's also an unspoken expectation in many settings that the audience ought to be doing a certain thing and ought to behave a certain way and ought to receive it in a certain way. Mm. It, it isn't explained. You know, if you go to if you go to Glyndebourne, which is wonderful, but many people won't go to the opera because they think they must know certain things. And it's it's um that's a bit tricky. You know? And I sort of think, you know, we're an orchestra for people of of low skill, as it were. But um, <gasps> <laughs> well, I speak for myself. But uh, are we are we are, are we sort of in a way asking too much of people, uh, even just at that level? Because we've 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 taken some of the some of the sort of naturalistic the humanity out of the music by. Um, uh, too rigid a framework, you know, essentially we're, we're following the uh, classical music. And I realise it, obviously it's necessary or it sound awful, but... I don't think it's take, I don't think it's asking too much of people, but I do think it's, it's, you know, it's a genuine idea that we can explore different sorts of music that are inclusive of um, elements that mean that the audience can have a part in it. And that's something that's missing in a lot of, uh, you know, concerts, whether it's, um, you know, I mean, like the Peter and the Wolf that we did, where there's a story that everybody actually follows because they know what's going on, or whether it's something where 
there's a, a less definite order to things and there can be really interesting things where they call it gamified music where somebody in the audience uh, or the audience might be interspersed with us actually this is interesting and they do a something at a certain time which means we change direction and somebody else <laughs> does something so I played a piece of music and it was me um, a drummer and a singer and there were three audience members who were basically playing a board game and they like rolled the dice and they moved a certain number of squares and on the square there were different ordinary objects. So there would be a glass, uh, you know, with something in it. There was a set of matches and a candle and there was a newspaper and it was up to them what they did with the objects and depending on what they did with the objects and they could also pick cards and read words and things like that then the performers did different things. So if they took a sip of the drink, it meant that I had to do something very sentimental with the music. And I continued <laughs> playing my sentimental music until they, you know, they, the next person did something else with the drink. Whereas if somebody read the newspaper, it meant that the singer started declaring things in a recitative sort of way. And so we had, sometimes things went together and were harmonious, other times there were clashes, but it was determined by the audience. So, I mean, there's no reason we can't do something like that and it doesn't have to sound crazy. It can be quite organized, you know. I think there's something in what Mark was talking about, about our playing with a view to playing to an audience. And because actually, I think in many respects, we are our own audience. Mm -hmm. really? And my yeah. other thought is that having a view to playing to an audience, I find is an unwelcome pressure sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, because I think, well, this just, this just wouldn't start, stand up to scrutiny. And therefore, that's, that's not good enough. But, and it, it, and it, it elides the enjoyment of the doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I can definitely agree. Yeah, go on, Alex. Go on, Alex. I think most of our audience members come knowing that we play just for the sheer joy of it, not because we're ever going to be professionals or anything. Like that. And they come with those expectations. And you know yourself, if you think, watch somebody who's perhaps not the highest standard, you just want them to do the best they can. And I think there's an enjoyment in, in that. You know, if I'm going to Wigmore Hall and someone plays a bum note, I want my money back. That's a different <laughs> <standard>. <laughs> But that's not what One we're note. about. They're but, doing but, it as a job. This, this, we're doing it because we love it. There's something else, though, because I play, um, I'm learning to play the classical guitar, and I really enjoy playing duets and small group music, but I have no wish to, to do it to somebody else. It's very much an enjoyment in the moment thing, wanting to do it love, in a lovely way, but not particularly wanting to perform it. Yes, well, I think our audiences are more, we allow people to join in with us playing it through, as opposed to we are demonstrating this thing for you or at you. Yeah. You know, it's still about us playing it. And if, if we had to stop in the middle and start over, it wouldn't, you know, that's okay. And they'd have to put up with it because that's not, <laughs> You know, yeah. They've never asked us to stop. No. no. <laughs> and I do think they keep coming back. They do. I do think there is something. I I think that genuinely, people who've come to hear us play have enjoyed those concerts more than many concerts they've paid money to hear professionals play. Because you can have a lot of perfect music, you know, perfect music that's completely boring and, and soulless. Uh, is this similar that. to the oh sorry Ray go for it I was saying nobody's ever walked out of one of our concerts <laughs> we lock the doors <laughs> oh, <that's weird. laughs> I, I wonder if there's some uh, similarity with the uh, you know we're sort of asking the uh, the audience to treat it in the way that um you know, uh, as though we were improvising in a way that there's, a, you know, that you have to love every sound that's being made and, uh, you know, get your mind in the right place in order to enjoy it. Um, and there is some sort of, oh, I don't know, maybe I'm reaching too far. No, I think you've got something there. You know, it's about the essence of what we're doing. 
And it's mm. important. It's about that the expectation of and for the audience and of and for the players. And communicating that means that we may actually get something across of the, the joy of the, the music. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree with you, Laura. That's exactly what it's about. It's a communication between two sets of people. And I, for one, absolutely dreaded the concerts. As Laura knows, I hate being in public. I really loathe it. And it's done me, personally, so much good to do that. But I've actually got a huge amount of enjoyment out of it. And everyone I know I spoke to who came absolutely loved it. So I think, yeah, it's good all round. <laughs> sort of, that's my view, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to improvisation, I just want to say that last this wasn't improvisation, but it leads to an idea. Last night, I met up with the other three flautists from Bob the Band in Hoffman Park, socially distanced, facing each other, and we played two and two duets. And it was so lovely to be playing with other people. It wasn't performance, it was sight reading. If it wasn't a piece that you already knew, we were sight reading, and sight reading goes wrong sometimes. Occasionally there was someone walking past and you'd suddenly realise, oh, actually, people are standing listening to this. <laughs> but I was just wondering, thinking of improvising, if there might be groups of four or six people from orchestra, who might just like to meet up in Priory Park to sit in a group of four or six or whatever and and play. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a great idea. You know, I was just thinking, like, Mark should have brought his trombone on that walk and he could have played to the cows. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently cows love brass instruments. I know, they do. They do. <laughs> But I think that's a great idea because it's we're not going to have all of us together anytime soon. But a few people outside and there's some enormous freedom in being able to it's like looking in the mirror. You know, if you're outside and you play you've let it go. You've let it go into the wind and it's amazing, you know. I think that is a great idea. My, my, am I allowed to put this? This is an idea. Am I allowed to put this on our website? Yeah. yeah. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Could, could we do somewhere slightly less public than Farry Park? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bosom, Bosom Meadow's good, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and when we went to Hoffman Park, we, um, we sort of got out of our cars in the car park and everybody wanted to go for the the darkest under tree corner we could find. <laughs> if this cuts us all off, would you like to rejoin? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. So when it cuts us all off, I'll rejoin it. Okay. Cool. Okay. Should we all leave? It says less than a minute. Yeah. Okay, let's all wave. Bye. Bye. See you in a minute. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>